All right, everyone, welcome to the fourth Money Masters Twitter space. So exciting. I'm Dave. I don't know it. And today we're going to be talking to you guys about a very interesting topic that has been making its way around the news, uh, government debt. So just like every other podcast, we're going to start off with a quick recap of last week and also introduce you guys to ourselves and what Money Masters is. So my name is Dave. I'm a project manager here at Money Masters and I'm originally Canadian. I'm currently getting a master's in finance out in Switzerland and very happy to be here with all you guys today. What's up, everybody? I'm Noah. Uh, also here working on content development here for Money Masters and uh, looking forward to sharing with you what we've got going on today. All right. And uh, recently we've been getting a lot of questions kind of just about what exactly is the purpose of our Twitter space. So uh, we've kind of narrowed it down to what our main goal is. So we're here to talk about financial topics without the jargon so that you can have a better understanding kind of of the world and the economic landscape that surrounds you every single day. And now we're just going to kind of give a couple of recaps about some of our previous Twitter spaces. So Noah, you want to take it away? Yeah. So we started off with, if I recall, we talked about the application itself. So if you're not familiar, the Money Masters app is a all-encompassing academy, uh, arena, articles, and platforms to help you learn financial education. So first off, we have our academy that brings bite-sized bits of information on all sorts of uh, topics related to financial literacy, whether that's your personal finance, investing, the financial players, uh, broad diversity of, of topics. We really believe that Anyone of any kind of ability of financial literacy can come into the Money Masters app in the Academy and you're going to get something from that. Uh, I always spoke a lot about our wonderful arena. This is a um, stock market simulation game where you can go in, you are able to partake with $100,000 and from there with various uh, strategies, do your best against other people from around the world. And that's not to mention that we also have blog posts and uh, articles that really round out to make sure that you can get as much as possible uh, from the app. So obviously, if you guys haven't checked out the application, we are available on the App Store, Google Play, and we do have a web-based version. So uh, go sign up for the Money Masters app today and begin your journey to financial freedom. Uh, in regards to two weeks ago, we actually spoke a little about inflation. So we kind of spoke about three key factors that revolved around why we are currently undergoing such an inflation problem in today's society. And we said that basically COVID-19 kind of started this with the supply chain wasn't prepared in such a globalized world to deal with some of the factors that came along with it, all the government shutdowns, the lockdowns, work from home. It was a transitionary period. Then obviously when you look more towards today, there were some overseas events that are currently taking place. Obviously the one that comes to mind first is Russia and Ukraine, which has also severely affected supply chains. And finally, currency printing. If you're talking about the United States, 50% of all currency in circulation was printed within the past two years now. So that kind of gives you a little brief introduction to the inflationary uh, situation that's going on. And then last week, we actually spoke about interest rates. Yes, we did. So we kind of talked about how interest rates are kind of rising, but also kind of the history of them, how interest rates have kind of fluctuated all over the place for the United States, going as low as half a percent to as high as uh, it was over 15% in uh, 1981. So, and how that kind of affects how uh, government feels and yeah, its relationship with uh, inflationary rates. Yep. And with that, we're going to get into today's topic. So we have around 10 minutes kind of to discuss government debt. So cool. government debt goes by a couple of different names, as you probably have heard over the news or just in conversation with friends. You've probably heard it called public debt, national debt, sovereign debt, and basically it just represents the amount of money borrowed by the government. So you've probably heard the saying before, the only two certainties in life are death and taxes. Well, the latter is actually how governments operate. Taxes are the government's form of income. And if you're wondering what this kind of goes towards, the government needs to take care of a lot of things with the taxpayer dollars. This includes public services, such as public school, uh, the police force, firefighters, and other things of this nature. Obviously, the government operations themselves, just to have order kind of go around at Capitol Hill, if we're speaking about the US. All your politicians are paid through taxpayer dollars. And then obviously there's other events such as Medicare and Social Security, which are also funded through taxpayer services. But when you're speaking about government debt, it's when the amount of operations that are currently under 
going right now is exceeded. So how does the government kind of get more money? And this is kind of where the debt begins to form. So for speaking about particularly that of the United States or Canada or ma many Western countries, uh, it's predominantly done through government issued bonds. So when the government runs out of taxpayer dollars, they will issue government bonds. And the government bond is basically a promise to repay borrowed money with interest. So for example, right now, if you're looking at a 10 year government bond, what kind of goes along with this is that every six months, the government will pay you a fixed amount of interest. And this is just because you're giving the government your money and it's just to show that it's trusting and it's also a good investment for you. If it wasn't a good investment for you, you would just hold your own money and keep it as it is. But in this case, you get interest every six months on a 10 year bond. And then at the end, which is known as the maturity date, the government will actually pay you back the original amount that you paid. So let's just say, for example, you gave them $2,000, you bought $2,000 worth of government bonds. They will pay you this $2,000 back at the ten after 10 years and also will give you interest every six months. So now, Noah, you want to get a little bit into the role that the government plays in debt yes. and also a little about government trust and how this affects debt. Yeah. All right, guys. So... There's a lot of nuance to how debt affects governments. It's diverse, a lot goes on, um, and we really can't take it all in one. But we're going to talk about how governments kind of borrow and maybe why. So to begin, I'm going to start with a little bit of an example here. So we have, uh, let's say, two towns, all right? We've got the wonderful town of Applegate and the cool, really town of Beetleville, okay? Now, in Applegate, they make apples. In Beetleville, they make applesauce. And between these two, we have the wonderful county of Custard County. Now, Custard County sees that there's only one small dirt road between Applegate and Beetleville. So the problem with that is, let's say that apples were going from Applegate to Beetleville, and they were getting bruised, damaged. It was probably a lot of problems, and it wasn't keeping up with the, the quality that was needed for the applesauce. Well, the Custard Town has a bit of an option there. They could borrow and put out a municipal bond, as you just kind of were pointing out, and they could borrow the money to build that road. And that bill it would make sure that trucks could go through easily, and there would be pass through, uh, and it would save uh, save costs, and hopefully revenues or at least uh, net profits can go up. Or they could do the same thing and build, you know, for example, a new football stadium. Nothing wrong with that. Great for, for you know the kids to play on. But one obviously is going to help produce more of an income later on than the other. And so governments need to be thinking about how they borrow their money and what's used for. And that's kind of part of the nuance of how governments need to borrow their debt. So we took a look at the a common ratio metric that a lot of governments use when we're talking about debt. That's debt to GDP. So that's looking at how much debt versus how productive the, the relative nation is. So we all really know the US right now, it's about 108%, but we wanna take a couple other countries who we really just don't hear from a lot. So for example, let's start off with the wonderful small nation of Kosovo. 17.5 percent mm -hmm. it's really low Not but bad. then it's historic we we also can look at you know for example greece who has gone through their own amount of uh, uh disparity 177 percent debt to gd uh gdp on the other end going back down uzbekistan 29.3 Quite not bad. Uh, but Mexico, 47.1%. So still under 50% despite the, the challenges that that country faces. Other countries are well known. Germany, 598 as they manage theirs. But also there's the historic side of Japan. We, ha we can't get away from this. 237% uh, debt to GDP. Now that is, of course, with some nuances to Jap uh, Japanese um, uh, issues. But nonetheless, it just goes to show that the diversity of what can happen with this metric. So, but again, countries can have different ways of funding. Like you said, they can offer bonds, bank notes, and countries like us can take on loans. Uh, various countries go to, for example, organizations like the Inter uh, International Monetary Fund to take out loans to help fund their certain projects. And then in repayment to secure themselves, they'll offer um, certain terms that they have to manage. So from that, did you know that the total sovereign debt of all governments right now is around $87.4 trillion? Nope. Even crazier, that's only 40% of global debt. Over 60% is through individuals and corporations. So I thought that was quite the interesting, quite the interesting bit there. That's awesome. Uh, so thank you, Noah, for that. Uh, and one thing that we kind of want to get across within this Twitter space is to educate you guys a little bit about government debts. 
necessarily it doesn't always mean that a government debt is a bad thing there is a lot of gray area when you look into different governments and how they operate for example if we want to go into the the country of norway very small population with a large amount of resources they actually have a government surplus of 9.1 percent when you look at their gdp to debt ratio but when you're looking at debt and it being a significant part of GDP, this leads to an increase in aggregate demand. And what basically the aggregate demand is, it's the total amount of demand for goods and services produced within the economy. And some people might say that governments spend foolishly, and this may be true, but once money enters the economy, whether it is a company or it's an individual, it is then usually spent again. So one of the big things, me being Canadian, going through the Canadian education system, doing all my university education there, whenever we learned about government deficits, we never really looked at it as a bad thing because whenever the government does take on bonds, it is usually a good investment because we do have a lot of trust within our government. And then after that, the velocity with which, with which money goes through the Canadian economy is very quickly considering how densely populated we are. Obviously, we have a lot of land mass, but one of the big things with it is that majority of people are actually located in four separate towns. So when the government decides to build infrastructure within this area and for long term purposes, we do actually have a little bit of a statistic on short term versus long term uh, development. It actually went very well for us and it actually did help us a lot. But then you can also look at government debt from the opposite situation where if they don't have any debt, it's kind of like a person like a regular person like you or me that's listening you are just holding the money so for example norway is 9.1 percent of their gdp is actually within a surplus so this money isn't being given back to the population they're saving it for a different time which isn't necessarily a bad thing either which is why we kind of talk about there being a lot of gray area within this topic so clearly they have increased flexibility lower interest costs costs in fact they don't have any and the ability to invest in future growth but that may come at a cost for the current growth that they're looking at right now obviously with the amount of money that they have they have trillions of dollars in a government surplus that could be going out to the population at the current moment so now with that we're going to pass it back to noah to kind of speak about short-term versus long-term debt yeah, so when we were looking at this, we actually came across a recent Harvard study that showed that long-term debt shows greater overall economic growth than short-term. So when a government borrows on anticipation of 10, 20, 30-year um, uh, debt, it actually shows over longer-term accelerated growth than when the government uh, borrows against short-term. So basically, when a government is planning itself, governments have a tendency to actually do really well. When they're kind of impacted on the short-term, for example, coronavirus that debt does not generally produce mm -hmm. long-term growth and this kind of was one of the very few consistencies that a lot of countries kind of replicated when we were trying to figure out how countries operate and we mentioned before they're not all equal how they manage their debt we were looking at actually here in Switzerland you know they actually see that their threshold for debt is up 70% GDP of debt to GDP after that they start to lose acceleration of growth from what they borrow and so they're always cost to make sure that they never touch that in fact they actually have averaged around 49% debt to GDP in preparation of that to make sure that there isn't much of a um, connection between their debt levels their growth and even their interest rates um, but it is interesting to see how other countries, when you look at how a country is borrowing, because obviously we can't tell you how debt's managed throughout all 200 countries. But when you when you are looking at a country that you might be you know, living in or investing in or looking at in any way, thinking about how they spend their money, is a government looking at a long-term project or are they looking at the short term? And that would be a good and an easier indication to help break down whether or not that it's going to be a, a helpful, uh, successful borrowing over that period of time. And that's kind of one thing that you guys probably thought that we were going to go through a full episode without speaking about inflation. But when you see short term debt like this being issued, it can be attributed back kind of to the inflationary issues that we're going through right now. Obviously, as Noah just kind of described and what was studied with the Harvard review was that government deficits within the short term can actually be very catastrophic to a country. As we saw with the United States, they were giving out stimulus checks and this caused inflationary issues. This is all government spending that they were doing off of bonds and stuff like that and currency printing. And with that, I believe we have ran out of time for today. 
But we just want to introduce you guys to what next week's topic is going to be. We are actually going to have our first guest on the Money Masters what? Twitter space. We are going to interview Keelan McDonald. So exciting. Who uh, currently works for Fonji, uh, which is a company that invests in startups and is like an incubator, so to speak. And we're going to talk to him about all things startup life, kind of what goes into creating a startup, and obviously some current financial situations that are currently going on. So with that, from David. I know it. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's Twitter space. We look forward to seeing you next week. Just one thing to note is that next week we will be performing on Tuesday. Yes. At... 8 Eastern time. So if you guys want to tune in, just remember that it's going to be scheduled for next Tuesday. And everyone have a great day and take care. Bye, everybody.